Hello, this is Marshall Goldsmith. Thank you so much for joining my webinar. What got you here won't get you there. We're gonna talk about leadership development, stakeholder-centered coaching, and team building. Uh, before we begin, just a couple of requests. I love getting emails, marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com. If you ever wanna send me an email, please feel free to do so. And, and also, uh, go to my website, www.marshallgoldsmith.com. I give all my material away, so you can copy, share, download, duplicate, use any of my material in any way you wish. Now, let me give you a little background about what led to today. I'm working on an exciting new project called The 100 Coaches, and I'll give you the history. A little while ago, I went to a program called Design the Life That You Love. It was put on by my great friend, Aisha Bursell. Aisha was ranked as one of the 15 top designers in the world and recently was ranked in Thinker 50 as the, one of the top eight talent thinkers in the world. In her wonderful program, Aisha said, think of your heroes and then talk about why are these people your heroes? Well, I wrote down the names of my heroes and they were all wonderful people who were great teachers and they were very kind and generous to me. So she said, why are they your heroes? I said, well, number one, they're great teachers. Number two, they are so generous. She said, why don't you be more like them? I thought, great idea. I decided I'm going to then mentor 15 people, no charge. I'm gonna give them everything I know for free. And the only price is when they get old, they have to do the same thing. This is a legacy project, a give back project. I made a little selfie video and put it on LinkedIn turned out to be the most widely viewed video in the history of LinkedIn, had over 12,000 applicants, and I decided to expand the program from 15 coaches to 100 coaches. Let me give you a progress report. We've already selected 55 of the coaches, and then the only, wasn't really negative feedback, the only constructive suggestion I got was, you know, these people you have selected are so impressive. Why don't we give other people a chance? Well, of the 55 people who've been selected, Five are in the top 50 business thinkers in the world. They have people from Harvard, from Yale, from the Kellogg School, Duke, top colleges, uh, multi-million selling authors, a wonderful, wonderful group of people, executive director of Sesame Street, former mission control director of NASA. Well, again, with 12,000 applicants, you can be a little picky. Great feedback. Why don't you give other people a chance? So now we're gonna adopt 100 aspiring coaches. And we're going to mentor these 100 aspiring coaches who maybe don't have so much background, don't have this distinguished record quite yet, perhaps younger, perhaps from developing countries. And if you would like to apply to either one of these programs, just send me an email. Uh, or go, just go to marshallgoldsmith.com slash application, marshallgoldsmith.com slash application, and feel free to apply. Now, um, what we've decided to do is, and this is what today is about, so many people applied, obviously we can't mentor everybody. I'm gonna be doing free courses like today though for the applicants who maybe applied but didn't get selected to the program. And one thing I'm really happy about with this whole project is, uh, Thinkers 50 just recognized our program as one of the top eight breakthrough ideas in the world this year. So very, very excited to be recognized by Thinkers 50. Now, welcome to Facebook Live. We have over 4,000 people who have said they wanted to see this now or later, and we're streaming it uh, at my website, www.marshallgoldsmith.com. If you have questions or comments, for example, I'm gonna ask you questions, and I'm gonna ask you to put them in the comments section, and then we're gonna save these for the end, and then at the end, I'm gonna be answering specific questions and reading some of your interesting comments. Now. You can watch this later on my Facebook page. We're going to save it. And also, I'm... Sla uh, webinars, webinars with an S, as you can see online. You can go look at this stuff and review the articles. Again, anything that you wish. So... Let us begin, let us begin. Oh, and tomorrow, one final thing. Tomorrow I'm gonna be doing my second webinar on my book, Triggers. I have done 36 books, and of the 36 books I've done, two have been listed by Amazon as two of the top uh, leadership and success books ever written. 
One, What Got You Here, and two, Triggers. So I'm going to do webinars about both of those two books. A little bit about my background before we begin, if you haven't met me. My name is Marshall. I'm from a small town called Valley Station, Kentucky. Went to school at Indiana, got a PhD at UCLA Anderson School. I was a college professor and dean when I was very, very young. Then for the past 40 years, I've done four things. One is I give talks or teach classes. So I travel all around the world speaking and teaching. I have been to 99 countries, soon to be 100. And I have, on American Airlines alone, over 11 million frequent flyer miles. So if you saw the movie Up in the Air with George Clooney, I have that card. I have that card. So the first thing I do is speaking and teaching. This is what I love to do the most. The second thing I do, which I'm most famous for, is executive coaching. And I've been the coach of the CEO of Ford and Pfizer and Glaxo and president of the World Bank and the head of the Mayo Clinic, all kinds of wonderful people. And what I love about coaching is, coaching is where I learn everything. So much of what I teach comes from what I learn in coaching. In theory, I'm supposed to be teaching these people. In practice, I usually learn a lot more than I teach. Then the third thing I do is writing books and articles. I've done 36 books and three big, big sellers. They are uh, called What Got You Here Won't Get You There, today's book, then Mojo, and then Triggers, another book I discussed. And these were all done with my wonderful partner, Mark Reiter, R-E-I-T-E-R, -E fantastic guy. He is a fantastic, fantastic writer. So he and I have done three books together with all been New York Times bestsellers. And then the final thing I do is, like today, I do things online. So I have about 750,000 followers on LinkedIn. If you'd like to follow my work on Facebook, please do it. I give everything away. You can copy, share, download, duplicate this stuff, please, any way you want. Now let us begin. What are our goals? Goal number one, what are the classic challenges that come with success? Everyone I coach is a mega successful person. I get to see not only the positive elements of success, I get to see the challenges that come with success. And we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about how to use something called what to stop in coaching. Uh, I'm going to share a process called Feed Forward, a very positive, upbeat way to help ourselves and others get better that works around the world. And then finally, I'm going to share a proven process for leadership development that you can use to develop yourself and lead others, and talk about how this ties into something called stakeholder-centered coaching. Obviously, I can't cover everything in an hour. I'm going to give my best shot at giving you the highlights of what I know. Now, let us begin. Before he died, I had the privilege of spending 50 days with Peter Drucker, the world's greatest authority on management. Now, last year, I got ranked number one leadership thinker in the world. My intellect, compared to Peter Drucker, is the intellect of a 10-year-old. He was so smart. I was on his advisory board. He taught me so much. One of the great lessons he taught me is we spend a lot of time helping leaders learn what to do. We do not spend enough time helping leaders learn what to stop. He said half of the leaders that I meet, they don't need to learn what to do. They need to learn what to stop. Well, that one comment led to my book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Now let's talk about a few of the what to stop factors. Classic challenges for successful people, successful leaders particularly. I was interviewed in the Harvard Business Review and asked a question. What is the number one problem of all those successful leaders you have coached over the years? What is their number one problem? My answer, winning too much. Winning too much. Now, wh what does that mean? If it's important, we want to win. Meaningful, we want to win. Critical, we want to win. Trivial, we want to win. Not worth it, we want to win anyway. Everyone I coach is a winner. Almost everyone listening to this webinar, you're winners, you're successful people. It's hard for winners not to constantly win. Now I'm gonna give you a case study of winning too much that almost all of my clients fail. I'm going to make a prediction. I will predict you too will fail this case study. Here is the case study. You want to go to dinner at restaurant X. Your husband, wife, friend, or partner wants to go to dinner at restaurant Y. You have a heated argument. You go to restaurant Y. It was not your choice. The food tastes awful and the service is terrible. Option A, critique the food. Point out our partner was wrong. This mistake could have been avoided had only you listened to me, me, me. Option B. Shut up. 
eat the stupid food, try to enjoy it and have a nice evening. What would I do? What should I do? Almost all my clients, what would I do? Critique the food. What should I do? Shut up. Now, as bad as that is, I'm going to give you an example that is so bad, it makes that one pale by comparison. You have a hard day at work, a hard day. You go home. Your wife, husband, friend, or partner's there, and the other person says, I had such a hard day today. I had such a tough day. And if we're not careful, our reply is, you had a hard day. You had a hard day. Do you have any idea what I had to put up with today? Do you think you had a hard day? We are so competitive, we have to prove we're more miserable than the people we work with. I gave this example to my class at the Dartmouth Tuck School. A young man in the back raised his hand and he said, I did that last week. I asked him, what happened? He said, my wife looked at me. She said, honey, you just think you've had a hard day. It is not over. <laughs> Next classic problem for smart, successful people is called adding too much value. Now, what does that mean? I'm young, smart, enthusiastic. I come to you with an idea. You think it's a great idea. Rather than just saying great idea, our natural tendency is to say, that's a nice idea. Why don't you add this to it? Well, the problem is the quality of the idea may go up 5%. My commitment to execute the idea may go down 50%. It is no longer my idea, now it is your idea. Effectiveness of execution is a function of A, what is the quality of the idea, times B, what's my commitment to make it work. We get so wrapped up trying to improve the quality this much, we may be damaging the commitment that much. Um, for um, many years ago, I coached a fellow named J.P. Garnier. J.P. was the CEO of a large drug company, GlaxoSmithKline. I asked J.P., what'd you learn about leadership as the CEO of this huge company? He said, I've learned a very hard lesson. And every time you get promoted in life, this lesson will become more real for you. He said, my suggestions become orders. My suggestions become orders. Now, he said, if they are smart, they're orders. If they're stupid, they're orders. If I want them to be orders, they are orders. If I do not want them to be orders, they're orders anyway. My suggestions become orders. I asked JP, what did you learn from me when I was your executive coach that helped you the most? He said, you taught me one lesson and helped me be a better leader and have a happier life. I said, what was that lesson? Breathe and ask myself one question before I speak. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? And he said, as the CEO of this huge company, 50% of the time, if I had that discipline to stop and to breathe and to ask myself, is it worth it? What did I decide? Am I right? Maybe. Is it worth it? No. No. Next classic problem of smart, successful people, I already knew that. Incredibly difficult for a smart person to listen to someone tell us what we already know without us pointing out we already knew it. I come to the boss, I have a great idea. Let's say you're the boss and you did already know it. Just say great idea. Again, we don't have to prove we're smarter and better than everyone we know. A great lesson from Peter Drucker that I'm gonna come back and revisit later. He said our mission in life is to make a positive difference. Not to prove how smart we are and not to prove how right we are. Our mission is to make a positive difference. Well, it's very hard to realize I'm not here to prove how smart or right I am. And then the next one is called passing too much judgment. Now, more good news about today. Everything I teach you doesn't just apply at work. It all applies at home. And at the end of the day, the people at home are more important than the people at work. I'm gonna give you four guidelines that help you be a better leader at work, a better coach at work, and a better family member at home. What are these four simple words? Help more, judge less. Help more, judge less. How many of us have friends and family members that might be happy if we help just a little bit more and we judge just a little bit less? Would any of them object to these changes? I doubt it. What are the odds that a year from today anyone's gonna come back to you and say, we miss that judgmental you? Well, very, very unlikely we'll have a problem with that one. Now, what I'm gonna do next is ask you a question. And then I'm gonna ask you to send in a comment and put that comment in the question section, 
so I can then see it and see if I can see these comments. We're going to do a little experiment here. I'm going to ask you to answer this question. What percent of all interpersonal communication time has been on A, people talking about how smart, special, and wonderful they are, or listening to someone do that, plus B, people talking about how stupid and after bad someone else did, or listening to people do that? I want you to take A plus B divided by all interpersonal communication time and give me one percentage number. Zero would be none. Obviously, the number cannot be zero. 100 would be all. The number can't be 100. Give me a number between 0 and 100. Now, for you engineers who are listening, I'm very aware of the fact that there's not a, quote, right answer. There is an average answer. I've asked over 100,000 people from around the world to answer this question. When you give me your score, I'll tell you how your score compares with the average score in the whole world, and I've already got comments coming in. I have a 50, a 65, a 75, an 80, a 78. 85, well, it's not, somebody said 100, it's not really 100, a, a 60, a 70, lots of comments coming in from around the world, a 75, 80, 70. Well, the answer to this question, the average score in the whole world, a 33, a 90, the average score in the whole world, right about 65%. 65, Dorothy just got a 65, uh, Rob very close with a 70, Angela 65. The average answer in the world is right about 65%. Now again, there's not a right answer, that's the average answer. And by the way, I've done this in so many countries, their scores are almost always the same. It doesn't matter what country I'm in, Saudi Arabia, India, I work all around the world. It doesn't matter, the scores are almost always the same. Now, here's my guess. My guess is you feel probably busier today, under more pressure today than you maybe ever felt in your life. I'm gonna give you a productivity enhancement tool for yourself and for your teams. What is this simple productivity enhancement tool? Reduce that number. Reduce that number. How much do I learn talking about how smart, special, and wonderful I am? Nothing. How much do I learn listening to others do this? Nothing. How much do I learn talking about how stupid everyone else is? Nothing. How much do I learn listening to that? Nothing. And what percent of all interpersonal communication time is wasted on that? Yeah, about 65%. Just reduce that number. Now, how do you reduce that number? I am going to teach you a totally counterintuitive, shockingly effective tool to help people change behavior. This is called using small amounts of money tiny little amounts of money to create big changes in behavior. This is very counterintuitive. Let's think about it. The people I coach, are they mostly poor people or rich? They're rich. Women or men? Men, younger or older, a little bit older. Well, you might think, well, gee, rich old men wouldn't mind losing tiny little amounts of money. That would typically be wrong. Rich old men hate losing any money. Watch them play golf. They play golf for $5. They scream at each other. They just hate losing. It is shocking how well this works. I find my clients $20 every time they commit one of these sins. One client, I'm going 20 bucks, 40 bucks, 60 bucks, and the money all goes to a charity and they pick the charity. He goes, he goes this is expensive. I said, you made $35 million last year. This is $20 for a little homeless child. Just shut up. He said, you're right, take 50. Well, it's not the money, it's the losing. Now, let me give you some examples of this process and how it works. The first one I'm going to talk about is called destructive comments. Those unnecessary comments about our colleagues. How many of you ever heard this sermon preached in your own organizations? We want to create an organization where people reach out across the company. We want to build positive, synergistic, win-win relationships with our comrades over here. Well, how about those silos? We should tear down those bad silos. How many of you have ever heard that sermon preached before? Well, what happens to all this corporate happy talk when we stab our colleagues in the back? Things get better or worse. This is a bad, bad habit. Now, I don't want to look like I'm preaching at you. I also get feedback. And if you look at my bio, you see all those fancy awards I've won. Oh, so many fancy awards. None of those awards came from my staff, and none of those awards came from my family. I'll never forget, my daughter Kelly was 14 years old. She goes, Wall Street Journal, top 10 consultant in the world. She said, Daddy, I want to be in your field. I said, Kelly, that makes Daddy proud. 
Why do you want to be in my field? She said, the standards are low. <laughs> well, I'll never forget a time I got feedback about myself. And one item was, avoids destructive comments about others. What score did I make? Eight percentile, eight. 92% of the people in the world did better than me. And I wrote the test. Well, I go back to my staff trying to practice what I preach here, and I said, you know, I feel good about much of my feedback. I feel good about this and this and this. There's something I want to do better. This business of not making bad comments. I teach everyone else not to do that, yet I have been one of the worst offenders. Then I said, if you ever hear me make such a bad comment about a person again, bring it to my attention. I'm going to pay you $10. I'm going to break this terrible habit. Then I gave them a pep talk. I thought they'd be embarrassed to ask for the money. Pep talk was not needed. They tricked me into making bad comments in order to pick up 10 bucks. I know we're giving this pep talk to one of our clients called. He said, we need this and this and this. I said, he always wants something. He don't want to pay his cheap. $10. My partner, Tim, called. I said, that fool, how'd he get a PhD? $10. By noon, I've lost $50, locked myself in the office, and refused to speak to anyone for the rest of the day. The first day, it cost me 50 bucks. Second day, it cost me 30 bucks. And the third day, it cost me 10 bucks. Still cost me money? Yeah. What score did I make last time on that one? 4.8 out of 5. What's that tell you? Spend a few thousand dollars, you get better. When I teach my classes, I find people $20 every time they violate one of these little rules. Over the years, and I donate all the money to nice charities. How much money have I donated to nice charities playing these games with my clients over the years? Over one million US dollars. And it doesn't hurt anybody. It doesn't hurt anybody. Now, the next one, this is great for the stubborn of the world. One night I had dinner with General Eric Shinseki. I love General Shinseki, four-star general, head of the United States Army, surrounded by two to four-star generals. He looks at me and says, Marshall, who is your favorite customer? I said, sir, my favorite customer, smart, dedicated, hardworking, driven to achieve, creative, entrepreneurial, cares about the company and customers, great values, high integrity, gets results, and is a stubborn, opinionated, know-it-all that never wants to be wrong. I said, sir, do you think any of the generals in this very room may fit such a description? He looked at me and goes, Marshall, we have a target-rich opportunity. <laughs> well, this next thing is great for the stubborn of the world. I find my clients $20 if they begin a sentence with no, but, or however. Now, if you talk to me, the first word I'm out, no. What did I just say? Shut up, you're wrong. But, what does but or however mean? Disregard everything you just said. This is a terrible, terrible habit. One of my clients was stubborn and opinionated. I'm reviewing his feedback report. He said, but Marshall. I said, that's free. If I ever talk to you again, you start a sentence with no but or however, I'm going to find you $20. He said, but Marshall, 20 no, 40 no, 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 60 80 100 He lost $420 in an hour and a half. At the end of the hour and a half, he said, thank you. I had no idea. I did that 21 times with you throwing it in my face. How many times would I done it had you not been throwing it in my face? 50, 100? No wonder people think I am stubborn. The first thing I do when people talk to me is I prove I know more than them or they're wrong over and over and over again. This gentleman became so much better at listening, just learning this one very simple technique. By the way, I want you to start listening for this as you journey through life. What is the most common phrase people utter when we agree with someone? By far, no, I agree with you. You've heard this a million times. No, I agree with you. No, I think it's a, a great idea. No, I think it's fantastic. I think it's fantastic. What do I say no for? Do you know what that no, I agree with you means? No, of course I agree with you, and I already knew that. You see, you're confusing me with someone who you think may need to hear you. You can just be quiet now. That no means, I already know it, you don't have to tell me. Listen to people talk, you will hear this over and over and over again. And finally, and get prepared for a little guilt on this one. If you're a parent, get prepared for some guilt. I find people $20 if they say, that is great, but. 
that is great, but what impact does that word but have on recognition? Disregard everything I just said. We're bad at work and we're worse at home. I'm going to share a story of two emails, a bad email and a worse email from people that graduated my class at Dartmouth. First, the bad email. The gentleman says, you know, I went to your course and just two days ago and you told me about don't say that's great but. And he said, my son came home with a report card and in the United States, the highest grade is typically called an A and the secondary grade is a B. He said, five A's and one B. So I remembered your little talk and I looked at my son and said, that's great. Daddy is proud of you. Then he wrote, my son sat there in silence. He continued, he said, I, I said again, that's great, your father's proud. Then he wrote, my son looked at me and asked, when are you going to start yelling at me? He said, I'm not going to yell at you. Daddy's proud of you. He said, my son was so happy. That's the bad email. Now for the worse email. Another gentleman comes to my class and he thought the story of that father was a funny story. He wrote, I went home and told that story to my family. I thought it was a funny story of the other father. He said, my son looked at me after the story and said, Daddy, do you think that is bad? I made five A pluses and one A, and you told me that is great, but, and I've never been so hurt in my life. His son was the number one student, the valedictorian of his school. What message was he getting from his father? Not good enough, not good enough not good enough. If we say that is great, but enough times to people we love, what do we teach them? There is no great. There is no great. There's only but. Now, learning from a great leader. In my role as an executive coach, I have a very unique billing system. I do not get paid one cent if my clients don't get better. Better is not judged by me or them. It's judged by everyone around them. By the way, there's a great way to test if someone actually believes what they're saying. You can ask a person one question and instantly determine that level of belief. I have never seen this question fail. What is this simple question? Do you want to bet on it? Do you want to bet on it? Now, if they say, I believe it, I don't want to bet on it, would you just learn? They don't believe it. They say, here's the money, they believe it. I bet on this every time. When you get paid for results, you learn a little bit of humility. The client I coached that I spent the most amount of time with did not improve at all and I did not get paid. The client I coached I spent the least amount of time with improved more than anyone I've ever coached, was fantastic to start with. 200 people got better and I did get paid. This is a very humbling lesson. For those of you with a background in mathematics, I made a chart. On one dimension it was called time spent with Marshall Goldsmith. The other dimension was called improvement. There was a clear negative correlation between spending time with me and getting better. Well, I thought, this is a troubling chart. So I go talk to my client who improved the most, I spent the least amount of time with, it was great to start with, who was ranked in 2014 the number three greatest leader in the entire world, CEO of the year in the United States. His name, Alan Mulally. Alan, CEO of the year in the United States. By the way, in a union company, he was the CEO 97% approval rating from every employee in that company. They love this guy. Not only is he a great leader, he's just a great human being. He works with me now. He's a wonderful friend. So I go talk to my friend, Alan. I said, Alan, of all the people I coached, I spent the least amount of time with you and you improved the most. I showed Alan my chart. I said, Alan, the way this troubling chart looks, had you never met me, you would really be good. So I asked my friend Alan, what should I learn about coaching from you? He taught me two lessons, which I'm now going to share with you. If you don't learn anything else from me, you're going to be a better coach and have a happier life. He said, lesson number one, Marshall, your biggest challenge as a coach is called customer selection. You pick the right customer, your coaching process will always work. You pick the wrong customer, your coaching process will never work. And he said, number two, don't make the coaching process about yourself and your own ego and how smart you are. Make it about those great people you work with and how proud you are of them. Then he said, as the CEO of Ford, my job isn't that different. He said, I don't design the cars, I don't build the cars, I don't sell the cars, I got great people. And he said, every day I tell myself, leadership's not about me, leadership's about them. Well, you see, for that great individual achiever, it may be all about me. For that great leader, it is all about them. 
Alan pointed out, when you're at the bottom of the organization, you need to make winning about you. When you get to the top, it's not about you winning. It's about them winning. Most of us never deeply understand these points. Now, I am going to now share um, a question with you, and I'm going to ask you to respond, because most people, I don't think, really do understand this very, very deep lesson. Are we ready? And I want you to respond. First the question and then the comment that goes with the question. Have you ever tried to change the behavior of a husband, wife, or partner that had absolutely no interest in changing? Have you tried that before, yes or no? And if that answer is yes, how did that work out for you? Send me some comments. <laughs> Have you ever tried to change that behavior of a husband, wife, or partner that had no interest in changing? How did that work out for you? Send me some remarks. Well. I get a whole lot of comments from people. Oh, here's the first one. It's from Wendy. It says, it does not work. It does not work. <laughs> a disaster. A disaster. I love these comments. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, some person said, I know better than that. Here's another one. Very bad. Very bad. Never works. Of course, it did not work out. I'm getting some great comments here. All right. Now, it backfired. I've got another question. If that answer is yes. I want you to send me a note, yes or no. And here's a person, divorce, I love this one. Have you ever tried to change the behavior of mommy or daddy that had no interest in changing? How many years have you tried that and how's it working out for you? Have you ever tried mommy or daddy changing, they didn't care? How many years have you tried it and how's that working out? <laughs> I'm getting lots of pushback, doesn't work, doesn't work. I was teaching, it's a waste of time. I was teaching my class at Dartmouth. I love this, a woman raised her hand. I said, are, are you trying to change mommy or daddy? She said, daddy. Uh, I said, well, what's daddy's problem? She said, he does not have a healthy lifestyle. I said, how old is daddy? She said, 94 years old. <laughs> I said, leave the old boy alone. He's 94 years old. You want to smoke a cigar? Oh, man, smoke too. Who cares? Leave the old boy alone. Well, great learning point in terms of helping adults change behavior. If they do not care, do not waste your time. If they do not care, do not waste your time. I had the privilege of speaking at the Inc. 5000 conference put on by my good friend Eric Schoenberg in Inc. Magazine. Before me was Michael Dell, the founder of Dell and he had a great saying related to this. He said, pay them to leave. Just pay them to leave. He said, it is not worth dealing with people that do not care. Now, a great lesson for you as a friend, a leader, a family member. If you do not care, do not waste your time. You see, if you're going to get better at anything, that motivation for your improvement is going to come from one place. Where's that? In your heart. If it doesn't come from your heart, you're not going to do it anyway. Look at the people I coach. I can't make them change what they don't want to change. If they don't want to change, there's nothing I'm going to do about it. I can help them change what they do want to change. I can't make you change what you don't want to change. On the other hand, I can help you change what you do want to change. And you know what? That's good enough. That's good enough. Now, I want you to think about one behavior. One behavior that if you get better at this one behavior, it's going to make a positive difference in your life. And then I want you to say, why will that make a positive difference in my life? And I'd, if you don't mind, I'd like you to write some in because I'd love to read these. What is one behavior that's going to make a positive difference in your life? And it could be like listening or giving recognition, being more patient, less stubborn, could be uh, clear goals. Whatever it is for you, it doesn't matter. I want you to send in that notes to me. What's one behavior that make a positive difference in your life? And why would this behavior make a positive difference for you? One person said, I want to increase my ability to sell my services. I want to listen more. That's a common one. Uh, so people have all kinds of good ideas. <laughs> Somebody said, I need to start cleaning the dishes. I asked my wife, how can I be a better husband? That's what she told me. Uh, I need to follow through. I need to work out. I, I need to not be so sensitive, be thicker skinned. I need to listen more, be a little more humble, I need to delegate more, again, all kinds of good things. Now, I'm going to talk about how feed forward works. I want you to think about that one behavior for you, and I'm going to talk about how feed forward works. I'm going to pretend I'm speaking in front of a large group, and I've done this feed forward exercise with numbers from six to 6,000. It always works. And by the way, it always works around the world. It doesn't matter what country I'm in. 
in Feed Forward, I tell people, we're now going to practice Feed Forward. And in Feed Forward, you're going to be in two roles. Role number one is called learn as much as I can. There's smart people in this room, and this is your chance to learn as much as you can from these very smart people. Then role number two is called help as much as I can. Well, there are nice people in this room, and this is your chance to help as much as you can with these nice people. Then I say, here's the way the exercise works. You're going to pick one area for improvement. Oh, they're going to have two rules first. Rule one is no feedback about the past. No feedback about the past. We spend too much time talking about the past anyway. Um, <laughs> let me ask you a question. You can make a comment. Have you ever been impressed with your husband, wife, or partners? Near photographic memory of your previous sins. And how does it feel to have those things brought up over and over and over again? Well, you know, many of us, unfortunately, we have with our husband, wife, or partner a little bad habit of pointing out their problems from the past over and over, just not letting go. So rule one in this exercise is no feedback about the past. Rule two is you can't judge or critique ideas. You can't judge or critique ideas. When people give you ideas, you can't say good idea, bad idea, I already knew that, that'll never work. No matter what people tell you, you're going to just stand there, listen, take notes, and say thank you. Now, I'm a Buddhist. I'm not a religious Buddhist. I'm a philosophical Buddhist. And in my Buddhist philosophy, Buddha said, only do what I teach if it works for you. If it doesn't work for you, it's okay. Just don't do it. Well, in Feed Forward, you ask people for ideas. And I treat the idea like a gift. If someone gives me a gift, should I say, stinky gift, bad gift, I don't like your stupid gift. What should we say to the nice people who give us a gift? Thank you. If you want to use the gift, use it. You don't want to use the gift, put it in the closet. Just say thank you. You don't have to do it. Well, one person says, my name is Joe, I want to be a better listener. Give me a couple of quick ideas. My name is Mary, I want to be better at recognition. A couple of quick ideas. Shake hands and talk to another person. At the end of about five or ten minutes, I say, give me one word to describe this exercise. People invariably say it's positive, useful, helpful, or even fun. Then I ask them, what's the last word you think to describe any feedback activity? Fun. Has anyone ever called you on the phone and said, I have feedback I'd like to share with you. Please come into my office. And you said, fun, fun, fun. Fun is the last word you think of. Yet in this exercise, people say it's positive, useful, helpful, or fun. And then I talk about why. It's focused on a future you can change, not a past you can't change anyway. Have you ever humiliated yourself in, in front of a group of important people? How much fun was it to relive that experience? Well, that's not a whole lot of fun. It talks about what you can do, not what you cannot do. It's focused on the future. It's not focused on the past. No judging. If I were to allow people to judge or critique each other's comments, they spend twice as much time debating the comments as listening to the comments. How much do I learn proving I'm right? Zero. How much do I learn proving you're wrong? Zero. What percent of all interpersonal communication time is wasted on that according to the world? 65. Cut that out. Life is much more, life is much more productive and much more positive. And feed forward is kind of a centerpiece of my coaching process, which I'm now going to describe to you. Developing yourself as a leader and a partner. I'm going to share a very simple, proven process for developing yourself as a leader and a partner. And this process is backed by research involving over 86,000 people from around the world. Step in the process. Get in the habit of asking for input. Listening in a non-defensive way. Thinking about what people have to say. Thanking them. Don't punish the messenger. I'm going to teach you how to respond to feedback, involve people, change, and then finally the importance of follow-up. Step one, ask. Get in the habit of asking a question. How can I be a better leader? How can I be a better friend? How can I be a better family member? Now, I'm going to ask you some questions, and if you don't mind, I want you to respond in the comments section. Are we ready? Question number one. Do you believe that we should ask our customers for feedback on how our organizations can improve? Should we ask our customers for feedback about how our organizations can improve? And, and the first one I see is Wendy who says, yes, yes, we should. I'm seeing yes, very good, that's important. Should we listen to these good customers? Well, yes. Should we follow up with our customers? Of course, always, absolutely, says Cheryl. Absolutely, says Ron. 
Now let me ask you another question. Have you been asking your husband, wife, or partner, what can I do to be a better partner in our relationship? <laughs> well, I don't see quite so many people hopping up and down on that one. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you see, who's more important? Those customers that don't even know your name? Or those people you live with at home? Get in the habit of asking those people at home, how can I be a better husband? How can I be a better wife? How can I be a better partner? How can I be a better friend? And by the way, don't just do it with your spouse, do it with your kids. When my daughter Kelly was uh, 11 years old and my son Brian was nine, I've been asking my children a question, a question we as parents don't ask enough. What was that question? What can I do to be a better parent? If it's worthwhile to say, what can I do to be a better boss or a better team member? What's more important? What can I do to be a better parent? Well, the problem with asking the question is you get the answer. My daughter Kelly said, you know, Daddy, you travel a lot. That's not what bothers me. What bothers me is the way you act when you come home. You talk on the phone, you watch sports. You do not spend much time with me. And she said one time it was Saturday and I wanted to go to party at my friend's house. And, and Mommy said I could not go to that party. I had to stay home and spend time with you and then you spent no time with me. That, that was not right. What could I say? Oh, thank you. I said, Daddy's going to do better. Now, I'm very proud of this. I said, I'm going to keep track of how many days I can spend four hours with my family. 1991, 92 days. 1992, 110. 1993, 131. And 1994, 135. I made more money the year I spent 135 days, four hours with my family, than the year I spent 20. What I learned, the San Diego Chargers American football team, they don't really care about me. And you Americans will appreciate this. What I learned this year, they don't care about San Diego either. They're gone. <laughs> well, now it's January 1, 1995. Both kids are teenagers. Daddy is so proud. I've got my charts. I said, kids, look, 135 days, four hours with daddy. What goal this year? How about 150 days? They both go, no, daddy, no, you have overachieved. My son said 50 is a better target. They both voted for a massive reduction. Daddy, I learned a good lesson. When they're little, it's important to do this. Why? They need us. When they get older, it's important for a different reason. What is it? We need them. We need them. So again, very good to do at work, even better at home. I was teaching a class for a company called the Kaiser Permanente Company. A woman came to my class and raised her hand and she said, you know, there's always something you've left out. I've been to your class twice. I've read everything you've ever written. There's always something you've left out. Please teach people to do this with their parents. Please teach people to do this with their parents. So I thought, well, that's a great idea. And I really started working on that. She said, I did this with my, I came home and I talked to my daughter, as you suggested, and she was 17. And asked my daughter, how can I be a better, how can I be a better mother? She said, we said, such a nice talk. Then she said, my daughter asked me, well, what can I do to be a better daughter? She thought, that was so nice, I should call my mother. Then she said, I asked my mother, what can I do to be a better daughter? She said, my mother said, daddy's dead. I live alone in the country. Every day I take a long walk up the road to go to my mailbox. And then she said, there's almost never anything in my mailbox. Every day that makes me feel lonely. She said, as your mother, it would mean so much to me if you would send me a little picture or card or something so when I would walk to my mailbox, there would be something that was in my mailbox. She started sending her mother little pictures and cards every day. What did that cost her? Nothing. What did that mean to her mother? Everything. Everything. She sent me an email a couple of years ago and said, my mother just died. The last thing her mother told her before she died, thank you for doing that. If your parents are alive, this is a great thing to do for three reasons. Number one, it's good for them. Even if they say you don't have anything to improve, they'll be proud that you cared enough to ask. Number two, it's good for you. What's the number one regret children have when mom and dad die? Why didn't I thank them for all the nice things they did to help me? Why was I judging them all the time? And then if you have little children, it's great for your little children. Why is this great for your little children? Well, you know those old people you're calling up on the telephone? Guess what? 
you are going to be those old people. You want your kids calling you up on the telephone? Your little child is not going to listen to what you say. Your little child's going to watch what you do. Our values aren't what we say, our, our values are what we do. Well, one woman wrote a note and she said, I call my mother every day and it means so much to her. Well, you know, that's very important. If you don't mind, I'd like you to write in a couple of comments on the comments section. Just answer this question. Who is one person you should be asking that question? How can I be a better to? And why is that important to you? Who is one person you should be doing this and why is it important to you? And we've got a lot of nice comments from Anil. We've got comments coming in from around the world. Well, whoever that is for you, some Tori said, my kids, very important. My suggestion is uh, she, my mom, my daughter, Whoever that is for you, do that. My partner, my partner. Whoever that is for you, do that, do that. And by the way, you won't regret it, you won't regret it. After we ask, we set up an expectation. What are these people, and someone said, how can I be a better sister, a better brother? So easy to drift apart from our brothers, our sisters, our friends. How much time does it take to call on the phone and say, how can I be a better brother, a better sister, a better friend? Well, after we ask, the next step in the process is called listen. And the first thing we want to do is the last thing we should do. What's that? Ask for input, then express my opinion. Ask for input, then express my opinion. If I ask for input, if somebody, and then I express my opinion, what's that sound like? Defensiveness, denial, rationalization. Typically sounds like making excuses. Just learn to stop and listen. Now, the next thing is think. Who is the greatest leader I've ever met in my life? And I've met many wonderful leaders. The greatest leader I've ever met in my life is a wonderful person named Frances Hesselbein. She was the National Executive Director of the Girl Scouts of the United States for 14 years. Peter Drucker said the greatest leader he's ever met. Just a wonderful, wonderful woman, a great leader, 23 honorary PhDs, editor of an academic journal, one of my best friends in the world. Well, Frances does one thing before she speaks that almost none of us do, what is it? Think. And a great quote from Francis Hesselbein that relates to speaking when angry or out of control is this. The second I lose control, the problem is no longer out there. The second I get angry and lose control, the problem is in here. Well, stop, ask, listen, breathe, and think. And realize when I lose control, I have become the problem. Think before you talk. Now the next thing is thank people thank people and avoid something called punishing the messenger. Don't punish people for telling you the truth. Now, again, I, I love getting comments. Uh, would you agree that punishing the messenger is a bad idea? Very bad. Well, we have people, very bad idea, very bad idea. And, and by the way, we shouldn't punish the messenger. We want to encourage people to tell the honest truth. Would you agree with that? Oh yeah, yeah. honest truth, punishing the messenger, bad. And then I ask people, well, would you punish the messenger? No, no, no. I'm now going to give you a case study of punishing the messenger that almost all my clients fail. And I, I think you may fail it yourself. Here's the case study. You have a hard day at work, a hard day, you go home. Your husband, wife, friend, or partner's there. You get in the car, you're driving to the store. On the way to the store, your partner says, look out, there's a red light up ahead. Did you say thank you? Or did you say, what do you mean there's a red light ahead? Don't you think I can drive this car? I know how to drive the car. Why don't you be quiet and let me drive? Well, guess what? Most of us say that is exactly what I did. What was the cost of that person saying, hey, there's a red light up ahead? Nothing. What could that have saved your life, their life, and the lives of other innocent people? Somebody gives us something that has a fantastic potential benefit and costs nothing. What should we say to this great person? Thank you, thank you, thank you. And don't punish people for telling us the truth. Very easy in theory, difficult in practice. Next time you're driving that car and that person corrects your driving, you're gonna go like this. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> now I'm gonna give you two examples of asking for input. Oh, and by the way, why do we yell at that person? Two words, ego, pride. Too much ego and too much pride. And do we pay a price later for that prideful and egotistical outburst? Yeah. 
Happy price or sad price? Sad price. Fight that ego and pride nonsense. I'm going to give you two examples of asking for input, a very positive one and, and a negative one. First, a negative. There's a great book called The Checklist Manifesto, published by Dr. Atul Gawande from Harvard Medical School. By the way, a wonderful, wonderful person, a great book. In his book, Dr. Gawande makes a sobering point. If you go in for a surgery and the nurse asks the doctor a series of very simple questions from a checklist before the surgery, the odds on unneeded infection plummet and the death rate because of unnecessary infection is cut by about two thirds. Huge majority of hospitals around the world don't allow the nurse to ask the doctor the questions. Why? Ego. What's the first question? Did you wash your hands? According to Dr. Gwandi, more people have died because of the egos of surgeons than died in the Vietnam War, the Afghan War, and the Iraqi War combined. Now that's the negative case study. Now for the positive. For nine years, I trained the admirals in our fine United States Navy. And it's a little bit of my way to give back. I don't charge the admirals any money or the Navy any money. They don't pay me, they give me treats. So one year, my treat was day in a nuclear submarine. Me and eight other old men got to go diving under the water in this nuclear submarine for about eight hours and pretending to torpedo things. Oh, we had such a big old time. Then a couple years later, got an even better treat. Where did I get to go? How we to on the danger zone. If you've seen the movie Top Gun, I got to fly 95 minutes on a United States Navy Top Gun fighter jet. Six G's, oxygen, flying upside down, doing tricks. Got to fly the plane myself for about 10 minutes. And I am very proud to say I did not throw up. <laughs> Before we took off, I noticed this kid is asking my host, Admiral Mark Guadagnini, the man in charge of naval aviation training at the time, questions from a checklist. Now, these weren't tricky questions. First question for the doctor, did you wash your hands? First question for the Admiral, how much fuel do you have? I said, I said sir, this is puzzling. Uh, the doctor don't like the nurse asking them the question because their ego is too big. I said, no offense, sir. No one in the world's got a bigger ego. The United States Navy Top Gun fighter jet pilot becomes an admiral. You have the biggest ego in the world. Yeah, you don't care. The kid asks you the question. I said, sir, what's the difference? He looked at me and said, Marshall, there's a huge difference. Operation crashes, you die. And plane crashes, I die. He said, you put a gun to that doctor's head and said, if this patient dies of an unneeded infection, I'm blowing your brains out. They'd probably ask those questions twice. Well, too much ego and too much pride. Every day we make it more important our health, the safety, people we love. Get over that ego and pride nonsense. Life's a whole, whole lot better for everybody. Now, the next thing is respond to feedback. Yes, I'm a pioneer in the world of 360 degree feedback, a pioneer. I'm, I'm going to warn you in advance in life, it's not always good when people call you a pioneer all the time. What does that mean? Old, old. Then it gets worse, they give you that Lifetime Achievement Award. What's that one mean? Looks like he's about to die there. <laughs> I was very honored I'm getting the, this from Harvard this year, Lifetime Achievement Award, Harvard Institute for Coaching. <laughs> well, must be getting old. I don't know a lot about a lot. I know a whole lot about how to respond to 360 degree feedback. And I'm going to share exactly how I teach my clients to do this. If you ever get this kind of feedback yourself, feedback from your coworkers, your managers, people all around you, I recommend it for you or the people that you coach. How I respond, positive, simple, focused, and fast. It sounds something like this. I'd say, Mr. and Ms. Coworker, you know, we've been to that feedback process. And the first thing I want to say is thanks to everybody who participated. I don't know who said what. A lot of people took time to help me. I just want to say how grateful I am. Thank you and say, you know, a lot of my feedback is positive and tell what the positives are, ethical, dedicated, hardworking, driven to achieve, creative, getting results. Then say thank you for the positives. I don't know who said what. Many people said good things. I want to say how grateful I am. Then don't ask for more feedback about the past. Do feed forward. Ask for ideas for the future. I'd say, Mr. and Ms. Coworker, you know, I'm not going to ask you for more feedback about the past. You know what? I can't change the past anyway. I'm going to ask you for ideas for the future. He had to have an ideas to help me be a positive and open-minded listener in the future, what would they be? Whatever that person says, sit there, shut up, listen, take notes, and say thank you. Don't judge and critique. Now, never promise to do everything people say. Leadership's not a popularity contest. I'd say, Mr. Miss Coworker, I can't promise to do everything everybody says. I would promise to listen and think about all your good ideas and do what I can. Can't change the past, 
can change the future. Can I get better at everything? I can certainly get better at this one thing. And if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to help me get better. How much time did that take? Just a couple of minutes. Positive, simple, focused, and fast. The next thing is involve that other person. Involve those people around you. And by the way, you want to change your behavior, what do you do? Set a clear goal, write it down, publicly state that goal, and then involve those people and get a support group of people to help you achieve your goal. And then next is change. I had been in business for 12 years before anybody asked me what I considered to be the great existential question. What was it? Does anyone ever really change? Does anyone ever really change? Well, I, I listened to this and I thought, hmm. I don't have any research to, improve, to prove it, so I guess the answer is I don't know. For 28 years, I've been answering that question. Now I do know. I know who changes, who does not change, why people change, and why people don't change. The key to making change last is you have to follow up and stick with it. What's follow up sound like? Mr. Miss Coworker, two months ago I said I wanted to be a more positive and open-minded listener. Based on the last two months, please give me ideas for the next two months. Four months ago, I said I wanted to be a more positive and open-minded listener. Based on the last two months, give me ideas for the next two months. Six months, eight months, ten months. What happens if you use this very simple follow-up process that I just described? Well, I'm going to answer this not from a theory point of view, but from a research point of view. And this is a research study called Leadership as a Context Sport. And if you go to that, uh, the website uh, I recommended, the URL, go to marshallgoldsmith.com, you can find this article. This is research from 86,000 participants. And we've now replicated this study with 248,000 people from around the world. There is no country this doesn't work. There is no industry this doesn't work, and there is no level of management this doesn't work, all the way from a first-line supervisor to a CEO. In our research, every leader got multi-rater feedback. They were all asked to pick important behavior to improve. They were asked to talk to people, just like I illustrated, and they were asked to follow up. Then we measured, did they get better? Not as judged by themselves, as judged by everyone around them. What did we learn in our research? When people said, my coworker went to that program but did no follow-up, look at this scale. Minus three became a less effective leader, plus three more effective, zero didn't change. If you know about probability and statistics, that looks a little bit better than a normal distribution curve. I've done something called a control group study before. No training, no feedback, no nothing. The control group did that well. These people might as well have been watching situational comedies as go to a training program and get feedback. Total waste of time. When people said my coworker did a little follow-up, just a little, the result's a little better. Table, that third table, some follow-up a lot better. When people said coworker did frequent follow-up much better, and finally consistent or periodic follow-up, massive improvement. Well, this was a humbling lesson. They, in most cases, they all went to the same program, talked by the same person, me, and they got feedback on the same process at the same time. What did I learn? Well, to quote my friend Alan Mulally, if you get better, it doesn't have much to do with me. It's got a lot to do with you. Everything I just taught you works. It doesn't kind of work or sort of work or only work in this country or that country. It pretty much always works. Shockingly, it, it doesn't work if you don't do it. And the key to understanding it, the key is not understanding it, excuse me, the key is doing it. If you do this stuff, it's going to work. It doesn't work if you don't do it. Let me give an example. When my book, What Got You Here, Won't Get You There, was the number one best-selling business book in the United States, the number one best-selling diet book in the United States sold 10 times as many copies. Americans get fatter and fatter and fatter purchasing more and more diet books. Well, nobody loses weight because you purchase a diet book. You got to go on a diet. I made one mistake with that book, too late now, the title. I love the title, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. I had to write the book over, would have changed the title. I should have named that book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, Diet. <laughs> Then I would have sold even more copies. <laughs> now, a common question I get is, do people really change behavior? Or are they merely perceived as changing because they, they do all that follow-up? And the answer is the opposite of what you might think. It's a whole lot easier to change behavior than it is to change perception. One of the best research principles in psychology is called cognitive dissonance theory. We all view people in a manner that's consistent with our previous stereotype. 
and it is hard to change that stereotype. Let me give you a very simple behavioral example. Let us imagine your problem is you make too many destructive comments. Now, I picked that because it sounds so simple. Just I mean, quit doing it, the problem goes away. Not so simple. You go seven months and never make a destructive comment about anyone. Seven months later, you're my boss. You say, stupid SOBs on finance, idiot bean counters. How do we get any of those companies run by a bunch of stupid accountants? I hear you. My reaction, he's never changed. That one negative comment will trigger my previous stereotype. He's never changed. Situation two, you talk to me. Coworker Marshall, I want to be a great team player, not make bad comments. Give me ideas. Well, I listen. I may give you ideas. I'm not sure you're going to change. What happens, though, two months later? It's been two months. Give me ideas based on the last two months for the next two, I think. You've done a good job. Keep it up. Four months. Good job. Keep it up. Six months. To be honest, I didn't think you'd change. You worked very hard. Thank you. Seven months. Oh, stupid SOBs in finance. I say, you went seven months without doing that. You shouldn't have said that. The manager says, you're right, I'm going to apologize. Situation A, did behavior change? Yes. Did perception change? No. Situation B, did behavior change? Yes. Did perception change? Yes. Now, if you have a Roman numeral watch, I'm going to see if I can do a little quiz here. And uh, Luke, if you can see, help me so I can see the comments. If you have a Roman numeral watch, I'm going to ask you a question. Cover up your watch so you can't see the face of that watch. And my question is going to be quite simple. Uh, what does the four look like on that watch? Uh, send that in on your comments. What does that four look like? For example, the Roman numeral 10, that's X, of course. What does that Roman numeral four like, look like on your watch or clock? So just send that in as a written comment. And almost everyone I work with, you know what they say? Well, that Roman numeral four, obviously, well, that, that's a IV, IV. Well, if you have a Roman numeral watch or clock, look closely. In about 95% of the cases, that Roman numeral four is not an IV. It's four eyes. And I'm looking at these comments, IV, 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 IV. Well, look closely. For most of you, for about 95% of the cases, you're going to see that Roman numeral four is four eyes, four eyes. Well, the Roman god Jupiter symbol was an IV. I've done this, by the way, with people that owned the Roman numeral watch or clock for 40 years, and they couldn't see it. The same, they looked at it every day, they couldn't see it. We don't see what's there. We see what we think is supposed to be there. The Roman god Jupiter symbol was an IV, considered sacrilegious to put on a sundial. The ancient sundials had four eyes. The Swiss copied the sundial in making the Roman numeral watch or clock. The huge majority of watches and clocks have four eyes. Very few people ever see it. It's hard to change that perception. Now I'm going to wrap up and I'm going to share kind of the basics of our stakeholder-centered coaching process and how we can use this for team building. Oh, and by the way, another thing, just as a reminder, I have videos on everything I'm describing, including this video. And number two, um, if you go online, we're going to have articles. All these articles are going to be covered. The article about coaching, about team building. Again, I give this stuff away. It really is my honor if you can use it. Now, first, our behavioral coaching process. When will behavioral coaching not work? Well, my coaching process doesn't help people don't want to change. If they don't want to change, maybe somebody can help you, but not me. Number two, this doesn't help people have been written off by the company. Well, sometimes people just don't have a fair chance, and this is not going to help them. Number three, my behavioral coaching process doesn't help people that lack business or technical knowledge. I mean, I get ridiculous requests for coaching. Pharmaceutical company calls me. Marshall, we want you to coach Dr. X. I said, what's his problem? They said, he's not updated on recent medical technology. I said, neither am I. I can't make a bad doctor a good doctor, a bad scientist a good scientist. Behavioral coaching only solves behavioral problems. It doesn't, people, it doesn't help people have the wrong strategy or direction. And finally, uh, behavioral coaching should never be used with someone who has an ethics or integrity problem. If someone has an ethics problem, fire them, don't coach them. How many integrity problems does it take to ruin the reputation of your company? That would be one. Don't coach ethics problems, fire ethics problems. Now, how does the coaching process work? Number one, involve the person and typically his or her manager in determining who are the key stakeholders. My typical coaching client has 18 key stakeholders. These tend to be other peers, their direct reports, management, if they're higher up, typically board members, then we encourage the stakeholders to be part of this change process. We encourage them, number one, to let go of the past. 
because you know what, you can't change the past anyway, and if they bring up the past, you demoralize people. We encourage them to be positive and supportive, not cynical or sarcastic. We encourage them to, to really uh, help that person by telling the truth, and then finally make it a two-way process. So when the manager talks to the person and says, I want to get better at X, uh, the colleague says, I can get better too, please help me. My friend Alan at Ford, I mentioned, I was hired to coach one person, 200 people got better. Then how does the coaching process work? After the person we're coaching and their manager, or if it's the CEO, the CEO and the board agree, who are the key stakeholders? Well, we interview everyone and develop a profile. We collect confidential feedback. We go over this feedback with the client, and help them analyze the results, and they pick key areas to improve, and their manager signs off on it. Then my contract is very simple. I say, if this person gets significantly better, this leader at these behaviors, judged by these people, is it worth this money, yes or no? If the answer is no, don't hire me. If the answer is yes, you can't lose. They get better pay me, they don't get better, all free. Well, the next thing is then, the leader that we're coaching is encouraged to follow up with each of their key stakeholders. Follow up, follow up, follow up. And then we follow up with them on a regular basis, just like I talked about in my earlier model, they get better, I get paid. Better is not judged by me or them, it's judged by everyone around them. I don't always get paid, but I usually do. <laughs> and then finally, how can you use this to build a team? I'm gonna teach you a quick process called team building without time wasting. And this is also an article, there are videos online, articles online if you need more backup on this. Get up in front of that team and ask two questions. So on a one to 10 scale, how are we doing in terms of working together as a team? And on that same scale, how well do we need to be doing? Two different questions. The average team in the world, we are a 5.8. We wish we're an 8.7. Most of us don't feel our teams are working together as well as they should be. Then you say, okay, team, we are a 5.8. We want to be an 8.7. Let's figure out how to get there. You ask the team, I want everybody to give me one or two key behaviors that if we all got better at this and improve the quality of teamwork, and the rule is you can't talk about people. You can only talk about behavior. Um, for example, we're all going to work on listening. Give me one idea to help me be a better listener. What's one thing I can do to help the team? Give me one or two things that if I did better at this, it'd help me be a great team player. Then each person gathers ideas. Then each team member is chosen, is selected one item. So now the team is all, for example, working on listening. I've got my input. Then I select, say, recognition. Then we have a very simple three-question follow-up process that sounds like this. About once a month, each team member talks to each other team member and says, hey, we're all trying to be a better listener. Give me one idea to help me listen better. Two, I want to do great at recognition. Give me one idea to help me with that. And three, I just want to be a great team player. Give me an idea to help me with that. As with everything else I've taught you today, follow up, follow up, follow up in measurement, follow up and follow up and follow up in measurement. And I think you'll get more long-term improvement in team building doing what I just described then you might get shipping people off to the woods for a month where they hold in and climb trees. But in the real world, nobody changes. Now, let's wrap up with questions. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to send in questions to me, and we're recording them here. And then I'm gonna answer as many questions as I can, and I think we have about, oh, we have about 15 or 20 minutes left to go. So let me answer these questions. Uh, first question that we have coming in. What's the relationship between an individual's academic and his potential for success? I would say that really depends on the job. In some jobs, a technical background or an academic background can be very important, especially at the beginning levels of management. For example, you might manage highly technical people and have troubles if you don't understand the basic technology. In other jobs, I worked with leaders that didn't have a college education at all who turned out to be fantastic leaders. They were typically not managing people in an area where high technology was critically important. So a good question, I think the answer is kind of all depends. Let me give you another good question. Give me an example of a client you coached who had the greatest behavioral change. A great, great question. Uh, have any of you seen the movie before called Wall Street? Well, I was the coach of the real life role model for Gordon Gecko in that movie. Michael Douglas, the actor, followed this guy around to learn how to act arrogant. Well, it turned out uh, fascinating. Uh, he wasn't immoral or unethical like the man in the movie. He's a very ethical guy. 
His score on treating people with respect, 0.1 percentile for both direct reports and coworkers, 0.1. I said, well, you know, I have a degree in math. That 0.1 is not real high. I said, how do you treat people at home? He said, well, I'm totally different at home. I said, well, you know, uh, he's single or married. He said, I'm married. Let's call your wife. Yeah, I've got a wife, two kids. Call my wife. Call his wife. She's, you're a jerk. Call the kids. Jerk, jerk. Well, I said, a pattern's beginning to emerge. I can't help you make money. You already make about as much as God, but I got a question. You want to have a funeral that nobody attends other than for business reasons, because that's where we're headed here. He said, I'm going to change. Not because of you or money of this company. I'm going to change because uh, I'm going to change because I have a 13-year-old son. And 30 years from today, if a man like you read a report like that about my son, I, I would be ashamed. I'd be ashamed he was my son. And my son already acts that way. I wonder where he picked that up. Maybe that was me. In one year, he got ranked a 53.7% on treating people with respect. Above the company norm, he went from a 0 0.1 to 53.7. Every year, he sends me a card. And card says, thank you for the help you gave me years ago. I, I still have better relationships with people, especially my wife and kids. What's that worth? This man's worth over a billion dollars. You can't buy your relationship with your wife and your kids. What's that worth? That was worth a lot. Some more good questions. What's the best advice you ever got? Well, I'll give you a couple of it. Uh, first, I'm going to share that at the end. The final comment I'm going to make is going to deal with this question. The best I ever got advice I ever got from somebody coaching me came from Dr. Fred Case. I was getting my PhD at UCLA and I was kind of young, know-it-all, smart aleck and negative and judging people all the time. And he called me in the office and we were working down at the LA City Planning Commission down at City Hall and he said, you know, Marshall, I'm getting some feedback. Feedback, you're coming across as negative and whiny and judgmental. What's the problem? I go, wham, 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 wham. He said, gee, Marshall, what a genius. You have discovered that the city government of Los Angeles is inefficient. He said, what a stunning breakthrough. He said, I'm not going to give you a PhD for that. Anything else bothering you? He said, oh, you've discovered that when somebody gives a politician millions of dollars, they're probably nicer to them than people who don't give them any money. He said, I hate to tell you this, but the guy pumping gas down in the corner knew all that years ago. Now he said, Marshall, you're coming across as negative, whiny, pain in the butt. Two options. Option A, if you keep doing this, you're fired, you're never going to graduate, and you wasted the last five years of your life. Option B, you can start having fun. What's it going to be, son? I said, Dr. Case, let's have a good time here. Well, I was still trying to do a good job. I was still working hard, but I dropped all that judgmental negative crap and started saying, look, I'm, we're all just humans here. Why don't we just help each other a little more and judge each other less? Well, that's some of the best coaching advice I ever got. Do I require my clients to keep track of their progress? Well, the answer is I require that somebody keep track of their progress. For example, uh, when I coached my friend Alan, a lot of the management of that project was done by his administrative assistant. She did a spectacular, spectacular job. Now, let's get a good question from Doug here. What keeps inspiring you? I love what I do. I don't think I'm getting paid a whole lot of money for doing this webinar right now. And I do tons of volunteer work, a hundred coaching project. I'm not getting paid anything for that whole project. It takes a whole lot of time and energy for me. Why do I do it? I love doing it. I love doing it. What's important in life? Happiness and meaning. If you love the process of what you're doing and it's meaningful for you, you won. Look, I love what I'm doing and it's meaningful for me. And when it comes to you, nobody can tell you what's going to make you happy. That's going to come from your heart. Nobody can tell you what's meaningful for you. That has to come from your heart. But I use myself as an example. You're out there finding meaning and you're happy with what you're doing. Keep doing it. Well, I, I guess I could be playing bad golf with old men at that country club all day. I'm having more fun doing this, though. I'm having more fun doing this. <laughs> then uh, another good comment, how do you get to be one of the 50 top business singers in the world? Um, well, there's an old saying, I'm, I'm here in New York, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. How do you get to be one of the top 50 business singers in the world? <laughs> work, work, work. There's a whole, whole lot of work. Uh, some other comments here. Uh, what motivates you? What motivates me is what's in my heart. What's in my heart. It's not something from the outside, it's from the inside. Here's another one. What is the key to coaching people at the top of their game? Well, everyone I coach is at the top of their game, and let me give you a challenge with that. That's a good thing, and it's a good question. It is a challenge. 
Any human or any animal replicates behavior that's followed by positive reinforcement. The more successful we become, the more positive reinforcement we get. And the more we fall into something called the superstition trap. What is that? I behave this way. I am successful. Therefore, I must be successful because I behave this way. <coughs> Wrong. Everyone I coach, everyone I know, we behave the way we behave. The people I coach are mega successful. And I tell all of them, you are mega successful because you are doing many things right. And in spite of doing some things that are pretty dumb. And you know what? I've never met anyone that was so wonderful they had nothing on that in spite of list. We all got a little something on that in spite of list. <laughs> if you had a chance to ask Peter Drucker a question, what would it be? Well, I've had the privilege of asking him many questions, and I, I think the biggest one is, uh, what's going to happen next? I'll, I'll tell you a story about Peter Drucker. I had, had the privilege of uh, seeing him about three weeks before he died, and Doris, his wife, called me up and said, you know, Peter's going to die, and if you're going to see him, this is it. It's been about 45 minutes talking to him, and we talked about business. I didn't want to talk about personal things or anything too embarrassing, and I, thinking I'm smart, said, you know, I think General Motors is going to go bankrupt this many years ago. He looked at me and he said, you know, Marshall, that might be true. Here's what I think is going to happen. I think if they get into trouble, it will be a time of extreme economic distress in the United States. I think the government's going to get involved. I think it's going to be more complicated than you think. He went on and on and on. He described in detail, many years before it happened, exactly what happened. This was so humbling after it happened. He'd been dead for years to think, what a genius. <laughs> what would I ask him? What do you see coming up next? Because he was, he was great at that. Have I ever told someone to leave a company? That's the question. The answer is definite yes. In fact, one of the first things I tell all my clients at the CEO level when I coach them is, if I ever tell you to leave, leave. 100% of the people I've told to leave have left. It's not because they're bad people. Hey, you've been there seven or eight years. You're very successful. Go out at the top. Go out at the top. The only client I've told to leave that didn't leave got fired. Why? Well, this person, through no fault of their own, bad things happened to the company. They just got fired. They'd been the CEO eight years. I said, leave, you're doing a fantastic job. Leave now, don't hang around too long. Well, never overstay your welcome. Never overstay your welcome. And always, when you leave, when they're asking you to stay, that's the time to leave. Because the alternative is they're asking you to leave and that's never quite so pretty. That's never so pretty. Now, what are the prerequisites for being a good coach? Well, first, I believe you have to have it in your heart. It's like any job, you have to want to do it, you have to love it. I don't think it's so much formal education for being a great coach. One of the best coaches in our entire coaching network is named Chris Coffey. He only has an undergraduate degree, not a fancy education at all. He's a fantastic coach, though. Why? To me, the key for being a great coach is focus on results. It's not what he does. It's, he gets great results with his clients. What would you rather have, a coach with a fancy educational background that does not get results with the clients? or a coach with no educational background, it gets good results for the clients. Well, to me, the key to being a great coach is getting great results from your clients. Um, did you ever work with someone you didn't like? No. And again, I'm very blessed. I don't have to do anything I don't want to do, and I'm not judging people at all. Number one, I like almost everybody, so it's, I'm not exactly a real judgmental person. I like almost every restaurant. I like almost all theater. I almost like everything. So I don't meet pe people I don't like. If I ever did meet someone I just didn't like as a person, I wouldn't work with them. Not a negative comment about them or me. It's just life is short. I don't have to work anyway. So well, why would I do this? Why would I be doing this? Now, I'm going to finish with my favorite coaching advice in the whole world. And I've just been inspired by all these questions. We have so many questions. There's no way I can get to all of them. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, though. You've given me so many good questions. There's no way I'm going to get to all of them today. Here's what I'm going to do. Tomorrow, I'm doing another webinar. Now, tomorrow, we're doing a webinar, and we're going to be talking about my new book, Triggers, or new R book, Triggers. And again, we'll have more downloads. And, and if you go to www.marshallgoldsmith.com, 100 coaches, and the, the number 100, coaches, C-O-A-C-H-E-S, and then put webinars. You can get all the materials from this webinar. 
Well, I'm inspired. Based on all your good questions, there's no way I'm going to answer them today. Here's what I am going to do. I'm going to schedule an extra hour coming down the road where I do another one of these Facebook Live sessions. And the whole session is just going to be doing one thing, answering questions. I'll answer, try to answer as many of these questions as I've received because I can't be answering them all right now. On the other hand, I like to answer as many as I can. So what I'm going to do is I'll just ask you for questions and spend a whole webinar doing nothing but answering questions. So that's just a great idea. So I really appreciate that idea. I'm going to finish with my favorite coaching advice in the whole world. Then we're going to wrap up. I'm going to give you the best coaching advice you're going to get in this or perhaps any other lifetime. What's that? Stop and breathe. Breathe. I want you to imagine you're 95 years old and you're on your deathbed. You're just getting ready to die. Right before you take that last breath, you're given a beautiful gift, the ability to go back in time. The ability to go back in time and talk to the person that's listening to me right now. The ability to help this person be a, a, a better leader, better coach. More important, the ability to help this person have a better life. What advice would that wise 90 be important in life and what was not and what mattered and what didn't? What advice would that wise old person have for the you that's listening to me right now? I don't want you to say anything or do anything or write anything. Just answer that question in your mind. What advice would that old person have for you? Whatever you're thinking now, do that. In terms of a performance appraisal, that's the only one that's going to matter. That old person says, you did the right thing, you did. That old person says you made a mistake, you did. You, you don't have to impress anyone else. Some friends of mine interviewed old folks who were dying got to ask this question, what advice would you have? On the personal side, three themes. Theme number one, three words, be happy now. Not next week, not next month, not next year. That, that great Western disease, I will be happy when. When I get that money status, BMW, condominium, I will be happy when. We all have exactly the same when. That old person is when. Learning point from old people, I got so busy chasing what I did not have, I could not see what I did have. I had everything. Many of the people listening to me right now, you're among the luckiest people that ever lived. Many of you have friends and family and health, and compared to me, you have youth. You got it all. Don't get so busy chasing what you don't have, you can't see what you do. Number two, friends and family. I'm sure many of you work in wonderful companies when you're 95 years old and you look around that deathbed, none of those coworkers are going to be waving goodbye. You realize these friends and family are really important. Number three, if you have a dream, go for it. Because if you don't go for it when you're 35, you may not when you're 45, you probably won't when you're 85. Doesn't have to be a big dream, maybe a small one. Go to New Zealand, speak Spanish, uh, uh, play a guitar. Other people think your dream is goofy. Who cares? It's not their dream, it's your dream. Nobody can tell you what's going to make you happy but you. Nobody can tell you what's meaningful for you but you. It's got to come from your heart. <laughs> have an embarrassing story. I was teaching this class a few years ago and I said, go to New Zealand, speak Spanish. The guy raised his hand. He goes, we're in Spain, you idiot. We all speak Spanish. <laughs> Finally, the business advice isn't much different. Number one, life is short. Have fun. Number two, do whatever you can do to help people. And the main reason to help people has nothing to do with money or status or getting ahead. The main reason to help people is much more important. The 95-year-old you will be proud of you because you did and disappointed if you don't. Final advice also saying go for it. Your world is changing, your industry is changing. You do what you think is right. May not win, at least you tried. Old people, we almost never regret the risk we take and fail. We always regret the risk we failed to take. And finally, for many of you, I do hope I get to talk to you tomorrow. Go to my website, look up the material, hope you find it on Facebook. And the final thing I'd like to say is, it's been my privilege to talk with you. My goal is to help you have a little bit better life and maybe help the people around you have just a little bit better life. Thank you very much. Thank you.